Thomas Comer, we're going to get started. He's a missionary pioneer to the Congo, to the Congo. Robert Mickey, one of the missionaries we support, is working uh, in the Congo now. And uh, it's exciting to see what the, the Lord's doing there. He's born in 1852 in England. He was the second of five children. And uh, the sheet that's going around, on the front of it, you'll see a picture of Thomas Comer. And on the back, um, on the back of that sheet, um, you'll see the, um, some of his brothers and sisters, I think, Dad Comer's in the middle, and then you'll see uh, four, you'll see uh, two of his brothers and one of his sisters there um, <clears throat> on the back side of that sheet. At the age of three, Thomas Comer's family moved to a Baptist chapel right beside their new house, and his dad was a Sunday school teacher, and they had a little... Uh, uh, they had a little nanny, I guess you might say, come in and teach the children. Her name was uh, Miss Annie. And uh, all four of the living Comer children that lived uh, to the age that they could became foreign missionaries. Thomas Comer was a good student. When he was given homework, it was done promptly. I didn't write that in there. I didn't make that up. Just pointing that out. They gave homework. It was done promptly. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, at the age of 12, his schooling ended and he went to work in his father's workshop. His Sunday school teacher from the ages of 6 to the age of 14 was a fellow by the name of Reginald Harwood. Reginald Harwood was Thomas Comer's uh, <clears throat> junior boy's age, Sunday school teacher, Reginald Harwood, took a real interest in these boys. Uh, he took them each week to play cricket. It's because they didn't know, didn't have the knowledge of a real sport. <laughs> so they played cricket. But then they took, he took them down to the river. So that was good. Uh, but what you have here is a Sunday school teacher who uh, taught him and then did some real-life things with him to show him that he cared. At the age of 14, Mr. Rickards became the Comer's teacher. And he mentioned that Thomas Comer, as his 14-year-old Sunday school student, always listened. He said that several of the students got together in the class and they had a prayer meeting where they would regularly pray for the, all the rest of the whole <clears throat> Sunday school class. Mr. Rickards invited Thomas Comer and the boys to his house and they would sing and he would give a 10-minute devotional talk. And during the course of those prayer meetings at Mr. Rickards' house, Thomas Comer prayed one day, I want to be a missionary. And uh, so the teacher saw this, brought a lesson, taught a lesson on the Great Commission. And this finally brought Thomas Comer to personal knowledge of his need of salvation himself. And it said that he was called to missions right after that same time. And he got some advice from his teacher. He got some advice from Mr. Rickards. He said to Thomas Comer, Keep your purpose warm in prayer every day. Keep your purpose for missions warm by praying about it every day. Keep talking about it. Second thing that he told him, he says, if you're going to be a missionary, you've got to, you've got to be a hard worker. And uh, <clears throat> the third thing that he told him was this, positions in God's army come to those who are ready for them. So get ready. So he worked for his dad. Uh, ages from the age of 13 to 20 developed manliness um, in his spare time he always had a book in his hand um, he began to borrow books from his pastor pastor would loan him books and he would uh, read those at the age of 15 
for two to three years. I don't know how he got in here, but he would sit in courses at Spurgeon's College in the evening. Of course, Spurgeon had a pastor's college in, in London, and uh, there uh, Thomas Comer would sit in on these in these evening courses. He's baptized at age 15, taught, began teaching Sunday school. All right, <clears throat> He had these great Sunday school teachers that he could model. So when he got a chance and they gave him a, a group, he went to business teaching the, the kids. And uh, he was active in passing out tracts. At the age of 19, he attends Regent Park College. Upon assistance from some funds from his home church. They didn't pay for his whole way, but they supported him with the funds that they could in order to go to college. He studied during the day, and then at night, his habit was to write personal letters to people that he had witnessed to, 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 to keep after him and to keep, keep on him. And uh, he developed a natural fondness for children. He, uh, he um, started a boys' prayer meeting. Um, but I, I have this start in my notes. There's one thing that characterized Thomas Comer more than anything. He never let any duty rob him of his protracted personal time of prayer. He just did not let a duty take that away from him. About college, he said this, college helped me learn more about myself than about my studies. And I think that's, that, that is uh, an interesting uh, recognition by him. As a missionary, even as a missionary, Thomas Comer often wrote back to his Sunday school class boys, challenging them for salvation, challenging them for missions. At the age of 23 years old, 1875, he's accepted by the Baptist Missionary Society. He was put in a 12-month medical surgical training uh, to prepare him for the work in the mission field. Medical surgical training. And then, in 1876, he was sent to the mission field from the Camden Road Baptist Chapel. 1876, in December, he reaches West Africa, Cameroons. And... Um, there was a man who had been in Africa, West Africa, for 28 years, founded the Victoria Colony, and evangelized some of the uh, tribes. And so this Victoria Colony was the first place of Comer's ministry. Um, I'm going to talk even a little bit faster. Here's the daily schedule on the mission field when he first arrived, Thomas Comer. 6 a.m., he bathed in the brook. 7 a.m., he drank cocoa and red. 9 a.m., breakfast. 11 a.m., he had a funeral. I don't think that's every day, but that was on this day. <laughs> At 2 p.m., he ate the noon meal, the, the, the afternoon meal. At 5 p.m., he went and taught the children, had a children's service. Uh, 6 to 8, correspondence and reading. 9 o'clock, in bed. While in the Victoria Colony, he gets a burden for the Upper Congo because he had read the works of David Livingston. And you know about Livingston's travels. It's, it's a very uh, uh, adventurous reading. Um, Livingston had wrote about the Dark Continent. He'd heard about the interior of Africa being the white man's graveyard. But he wanted to reach the tribes that were in the interior, untouched by Western materialism. He went on a one-month survey trip to the top of the Cameroon Mountains and met the kings of villages. Re read about Livingston. There could be a king right here, and then five miles down the river, you met with another king, and you had to learn how that king ran his little area. But, and if you made fun of that king and said, do you understand there's a king like five, five miles away? You didn't do real good making fun of the king and trying to tell him you're not really a king when you've just got this little area and, and working through all those logistics and all those problems were, was a challenge for Livingston. They had to take a lot of gifts with them 
and give these gifts to these different tribal kings that were all along the way. It's almost like paying tolls regularly. And if you didn't, if they didn't like you, you, you really were in trouble. Uh, every once in a while, <laughs> Livingston would get real frustrated and he would just cut a short, uh, take a, a long cut, uh, go out of the way to where he could have to avoid paying the toll because they were running low on supplies and he would find himself trailblazing through the jungles in order to get around that king who was unfavorable. But anyway, he meets these kings. And uh, one message that startled the natives that he met was the idea of the resurrection of the dead. That sounded um, to them uh, very odd. And so... Um, He's seen these different villages. Bemboko has a conversation with the king about, uh, about God there. He takes another journey of 21 days. Um, he goes through the Congo territory that Stanley uh, had recently discovered. Um, <clears throat> a Livingston Congo expedition had recently been formed. And they wanted, the Livingston Congo expedition was looking for people to be two things. Explorers and Christians, and um, they uh, were promised um, a, a, a steamer for the rivers if they would help chart and record the areas that they explored, and um, so the Baptist Missionary Society joins with this Livingston Congo expedition, and that gives uh, Comer and another guy named Grenfeld they got him in charge of this, this ship or this steamer so they could get up into the uh, interior uh, a little bit better. And they go to a place called San Salvador. And in that region, there's, a, there's an area called Banana. Pretty simple, Banana. And uh, <clears throat> there, uh, <clears throat> they saw that... Over a hundred years before, Roman Catholic missionaries had, had been there. And uh, they left. <clears throat> and the natives demolished all of the strange religion that they brought. Um, and uh, the, so the Catholics had abandoned it. They hear that Comer and Grenfield have reestablished uh, contact here in San Salvador. And the Roman Catholic Church immediately sent a Roman Catholic priest to try to uh, um, persuade the people toward Catholicism. Uh, they moved on up to an area called Makuda. There they meet a man who called himself the King of the Congo. Never heard of a missionary before. He thought they were there to purchase ivory. Of course, uh, any European that would come through there, often it was for ivory, that type of thing. And... Um, when he realized it was uh, for God and religion, uh, this uh, king of the Congo, Don Pedro, made life very difficult for them. 1878, Comer goes back to England to tell him what's happening. There becomes great interest in the Congo. Of course, you probably heard, if you've read anything about Livingston, when he would recount what was happening, a lot of interest uh, in, in, in Africa was generated through that. So Comer generated a lot, much interest. interest. Um, three people volunteered to help. One was a fellow by the name of John Hartland. John Hartland took over Thomas Comer's Sunday school class when Thomas Comer went to the mission field. And so now the guy that took over his class volunteers and says this to Thomas Comer, if you will accept me, I will go. In 1879, Comer addresses the Geographical Society, talking about what he had seen. He writes his brothers, Percy and Sidney, I think his, those pictures might be on the sheet there. Yeah, they're at the bottom, Percy and Sidney. He writes them. Uh, <clears throat> both became missionaries. He marries Minnie Rickards. Does the name Rickard ring a bell? Does the name ring a bell? No. He married the daughter of his Sunday school teacher. 
That's why there was such interest in this Sunday school teacher. <laughs> oh, I get it. He marries the Sunday school teacher's daughter, Minnie R uh, Rickards. And uh, 1879, they have a departure banquet, and away they go. They got back to Banana, San Salvador. They reached uh, uh, Banana there on June 9th, 1879. When they reached San Salvador, August 24th, 1879, Minnie Rickards dies. His wife dies. Sudden death from cerebral meningitis. Can you imagine all the shots that you have to get now to go to Africa? Um, <clears throat> here they are in the interior. She, she dies that quick less than a year of marriage. One week after her death, he returns to his missions work. He's threatened by a king when he's out in the villages trying to witness. The king said, throats will be cut and bodies thrown into the river if more missionaries come. Tell me what you really mean. <clears throat> Starts up the services in San Salvador, 150 people regularly attending. They had to build buildings. That's hard. Build a building in the middle of Africa. Mortar. Road to get the limestone. They had to make a road to get the limestone. They had to make boats to carry the limestone and the mortar to get it to their building location. The king of Banana received a 21-page letter from the Roman Catholic, and only Thomas Comer could interpret it. So the letter denounced Thomas Comer in the strongest terms. And uh, so Comer here is translating a letter that is uh, uh, certainly much against him. But he stayed faithful, and the gospel really spread. One time, Comer was sur surrounded by tribal warriors. They danced. They had weapons. They stoned him. He ran through the crowd, hit and bruised by the stones. Once, he was hit in the mid-back by a bullet. Jesuits said they were on their way to San Salvador. In 1882, he visited Henry Stanley. After six years, five mission stations and a preacher at each of them, a new steamer came and three new missionaries arrive, and they're excited. Within three weeks, one of the missionaries dies. And then his good friend John Hartland later, soon after that, dies suddenly as well. After eight years, he returns to visit England, and on the way, he hears of two other missionaries who have died while he's been gone. He's home in England for one month when word comes that Sydney had died on the mission field. Sydney is the bottom left of the Comer brothers. Sydney had died on the mission field, and Thomas Comer watched as his father expressed no regrets. Sorrow, but no regrets to learn of Sidney's death. He speaks to the Mission Society at Exeter Hall. That's in the life of Charles Spurgeon, Exeter Hall. He wrote a 140-page manual to help the Congo missionaries. He returns to the Congo with five new missionaries. When he gets back there, while he was gone, he realized two missionaries have died of fever. He reaches an area called Stanley Pool. He hears about his sister. Her sister's on there, top left, Carrie Comer, who had just married. She had died. His two assistants die. Another woman dies. He takes an 18-day break from his missionary activity to do a trip at sea where he wrote in his journal, it's not the length of life, it's the weight of service that matters. 1887, June 15th, Comer becomes ill. And 12 days later, he dies. But just before he died, 
just before he died, the last thing that's recorded about him is that he was singing a song called The Sands of Time. And you can find that song in our hymn book. Um, it's got tremendous words. The Sands of Time. At the memorial service at Camden Road Baptist Chapel, the preacher took for his text Acts 20:24. 20, And um, look something up here. In 1937, in the Congo Mission Churches, the Baptist churches in the Congo Mission uh, had a membership of 20,000 people. So we have a life here of uh, Thomas Combs.